guess you're wondering why I have two seats here with me. That's because next I'm going to invite two speakers. I get, well, I get actually one speaker and one moderator here on stage. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, our topic here today, as Mr. Bruno Olerhoek just mentioned uh, just now, it's disrupting the future. And as we all know, the buzzwords of 2018 is artificial intelligence and especially blockchain and also the Internet of Things. Those are merely a tip of the iceberg, but among the most Googled or searched words that we have on the Internet here today, technology has indeed run our lives and not just on the social side or with the social medias that we have here um, today, but also financially and professionally too. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the type of change that we face every single day. And it is only going to get better. So, ladies and gentlemen, who better to talk about disrupting the future than these next two speakers, or one moderator, one speaker, that I shall invite on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to invite our moderator first. He is the chairman of Interactive Group of Companies, a major ICT company here in Pakistan. And he has received the Distinguished Fellow Award in 2016. Please give a big round of applause for Mr. Shahid Mahmoud to come here on stage. Hi, hello, Mr. Shahid Madmood. I hope you're doing very well here today. And now, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, to accompany Mr. Shahid Mahmood, I'm going to invite an incredible, a very incredible lady here on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, she is a communication expert and also a prominent online activist. She was also the Miss Universe Tanzania's national director and also the founder of Change Tanzania. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause for Mr. Maria Sarungi. Say hi. The floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. Uh, my compliments to the management uh, to have a full August house. Uh, this is like uh, in the morning in Islamabad uh, when the rain is coming in to have all of you here shows the commitment uh, that you have towards the future of Pakistan. And in the presence of Honorable Professor Ehsan Iqbal Saab and Naim Zamidar and all the distinguished guests that we have from abroad and Pakistan, it, it is indeed heartwarming for me to start this conference with a conversation with a lady who has not only done things but has emerged as a prominent leader in a country like Tanzania. When we talk about the future and we talk about our neighbors, China, India, Iran, Afghanistan, the Central Asian states, the conduit that they're all looking through Pakistan is actually looking at Africa. And Tanzania, being a neighbor of eight countries uh, within their fold, who better than you to start the conversation with? Allow me to first ask you, because this was the theme in the morning, when you were invited to come, and I know this is your first visit to Pakistan, what was the impression, the 50,000 or millions of followers that you have on Twitter uh, give you about Pakistan and in the last 36 hours, what has changed? Thank you very much and it is indeed an honor and a privilege uh, to be part of this wonderful summit. And I'm truly very excited and I continue to be very excited to be here in Pakistan. Um, one of the first things that um, happened was when I told my family that I've been invited to Pakistan was to start taking me through drills of security and telling me don't leave the hotel and if you do leave the hotel you have to be very much available and you need to tell us, update us where you're going. Um, and I remember that I was very surprised because uh, we've talked several times with Shahid and I thought oh that's not a big deal. So every time I brought it up to people everybody was so concerned like are you going to come back? Like, you sure? It's going to be safe. But I think that the peak of this was when I was uh, crossing the border and um, the immigration officer, just as a conversation, asked me, oh, where, where, where's, what's your final destination? I said, Islamabad. And he said, why are you going there? I said, I was invited. 
He said, why did you accept the invitation? <laughs> but what happened? Um, as soon as I landed, I, I think I had a wonderful reception. But most importantly is yesterday, um, I just asked, just take me around Islamabad. I want to see. I went to see a number of shopping centers, restaurants. But for me, it was just taking in the fact that there's so much that we are alike. And I think that that is what has to come through. That despite the distances and despite all the news that we got, one of the first things that really struck me was how everybody was going about their daily lives. Um, there's not that much more security than, let's say, in the United States, for that matter. <laughs> and definitely, there was a lot of love and laughter. And I could see people mingling. Um, and more importantly, I must say, this is a country where people are really business-minded, always looking for the opportunity. Well, I'm grateful for all the compliments. Uh, the commonality that you talk about is very much there. Uh, if you look at our histories, uh, we were both nations uh, governed by the British. Uh, and uh, the streaks of the Portuguese, like I said, uh, Dar es Salaam changing into the capital, Karachi coming up to Islamabad. Um, one of the most fascinating things that I don't know if how much of the audience know, that you are a land-wise larger than Pakistan. Uh, you are about 900 plus uh, square kilometers and with one-fourth the population. Uh, and you are also an agri-based uh, economy. And this is where uh, I think we having uh, learned uh, how to move from agri to industry to other sectors, we have a great potential in our future relationships. I'd like you to sort of you know, talk about how you look at that aspect uh, with the mergers and, uh, and we can go on from there. Sure, uh, I think that definitely what many people wouldn't know um, is that when I quickly took a look at what Pakistan is involved in, what struck me was the fact that it is also an agricultural-based society, or used to be, and it has moved more and more toward processing uh, and industrialization. That has been a huge challenge in our country. We have been a very good exporter of raw material, and right now the fifth phase government uh, that is currently in power is trying to see how industrialization of the country can happen. But the primary focus has to be on agriculture because it is uh, assumed now between 60 to 70 percent of the economy and especially women um, and the young people are involved in agriculture. So how do you push that forward? Well, first of all, there is, for example, the problem of fertilizers. Uh, currently, there is a company from uh, Pakistan that will be investing in fertilizers, but there is also the opportunity of processing uh, and of looking at, I think, also the agricultural processes that can take us through, starting from the farming all the way to the final goods. Yeah, I, I, um, I was looking at the numbers of trade that we're doing, and you are one of the largest export uh, imports that you do from Pakistan is rice, but we do a lot of other agricultural goods, uh, and especially when we discussed about our mangoes. Uh, and uh, uh, there are, obviously, in the industries, uh, the surgical goods, uh, the leather goods, uh, there are other things. And we are also looking at, uh, as Pakistan, uh, and I'm sure the Honorable Minister would also further highlight that, being the value add for industries that the two of our emerging economies of the world are looking at as raw material coming from Africa. And that is where Pakistan uh, gives that great opportunity. How do you feel the confidence level in the people of Tanzania and, and overall Africa, uh, looking at Pakistan from that standpoint, that if we could uh, bring in that environment where they could come and safely invest and do the value adds from the raw materials that they own, like you have a lot of minerals, you have a lot of other things, and how that value add can benefit not only Tanzania, but also the African countries. Absolutely, and I would like to add something to that, because yes, how would that be seen? I think that the Pakistani and Tanzanian relations are not very active. Um, I, when I talked to a number of business people, including the head of the Tanzanian Private Sector Foundation, um, and I met, when I was at the airport, I met him and I asked him before if he had anything in particular that he wanted to do. He was very excited and he said, 
oh wow, Pakistan, like what, what other opportunities are there? So I promised him that one of the things I'll be doing is taking back, of course, a lot of the contacts that I have here. But what struck me, even uh, when I was having conversations at the Pakistani Embassy or High Commission in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, was that the knowledge about what Pakistan has to offer to Africa is not there. And um, when I was listening to the Honorable Minister about talking that the next big opportunities in Pakistan, I would say, I'll notch it up and say, the real big possibilities in Africa. Right now, 66% of the population is below the age of 25. That means that within five to 10 years, this is going to be a big opportunity. It is a threat in the sense that there is a big problem of absorbing the young people into labor, into giving them employment, and for them to generate income. That, I think, is the biggest, although we are a very peaceful country, it's the biggest potential threat if nothing is done to employ them or to give them some form of income generating um, activity. And that is one of the reasons why industries, investments will help. Now you asked about the business climate. I think one of the biggest advantage that we have considering the neighbors that we have all around is that it's a very peaceful and stable country. Um, we are a democratic country and there are processes in place to ensure that uh, the rule of law is followed. And this is an opportunity, I think, for many, because you pointed out about the fact that we're also the gateway to the eastern and middle part of Africa. Uh, currently, there is a railway being constructed that's going to give access in road to Rwanda. We already have one going into Zambia. So it's opening up the heart of Africa. And we have one of the largest ports in East Africa. Um, these are the kind of opportunities that if you go back and you talked about the similarities in history, it's one of the reasons, for example, we had visitors from Portugal, from Persia. So we, you know, Persia is a bit broad, but at, at that time it was called from Persia. That came uh, to the port, the Dar es Salaam Zanzibar port. And we are a mix of culture. Uh, we speak uh, more than a hundred and something languages because we have many ethnic groups, but we have one common language, and that's the Swahili. Uh, Swahili is a mixture of the Bantu languages and Arabic, because that was the lingua franca. So when I came here, one of the first thing I saw was Maisha spy, and I was like, Maisha means life, right? And yeah, I'm like, yeah, we say Maisha in Swahili. I said, dunia means world. Yes, I said that. We say the same thing in Swahili. So was, waziri, it means a minister. So we have a lot of commonalities and it makes it so much more important even for us is that when people come, they feel at home. We are a very mixed ethnic group um, and therefore different looks of people. Um, the potential of Africa is such that it is untapped but is also unseen. Just like Pakistan is struggling with an image problem that everybody, as I said, is so concerned about security so you don't get people coming. It's the same way with Africa. If it's not security, like in our country, it's about malaria, it's about death, it's about poverty. So that is where we really need to change the narrative and that's one of the work that I'm busy doing. Yes, that leads me to, uh, you know, when you said that we, you speak about 120 languages, we speak about 79, we have different ethnic groups and everything. And one of the things that really fascinated me in seeing how the youth, because that holds the future, and we're talking about disrupting the future, uh, was your hashtag Change Tanzania. I'd like you to share with us how you came about thinking on that and how is it really bringing together uh, the 120 languages? Because I think we as Pakistanis could learn a lot from that. Um. First of all, I think when, when people hear about internet in Africa, usually they say, oh, you know, that's only for the elite people in urban cities. And what has really impacted uh, people this year was the fact that 45% of the population now has access to internet. And of course, you can guess out of the 45%, they're mostly young people who are uh, on the internet. The easiest way, and I'm sure even here, the revolution took part with the mobile device. It makes it so much more easier today. The mobile devices in the form of phones 
are very accessible, even in price, and that sort of allows the young people, even outside the urban centers, to access the internet. Uh, the hashtag started in 2012 and gained traction in 2013, Change Tanzania. I was invited to discuss on a panel about where change will come from in Tanzania. And we had politicians who, of course, said everything is going to be solved by politics. And then you had the civil society organizations <clears throat> that said that we, the organizations, are going to change it. And I, my argument was that no. It's going to be the people and the citizens, because we have a platform today called the social media. This is a whole theory. It's a change of narrative in how we communicate. The reasons we needed political parties, we needed uh, religious bodies, we needed community organizations was because we needed to organize and to share our thoughts on a given platform. Social media now gives you that. So my, with that argument, I just tweeted it out. Uh, I'm very active on Twitter, and I tweeted it out, and I said, okay, I want people to explain. Just individuals tell me how you want to change Tanzania, and we started trending. And depending on, you know, on and off, we have a constant um, flow of, of uh, tweets, but depending on what is happening in the country, people will tweet. Sometimes it would trend if there's something that they really feel very strongly about, and continuously will be giving out different thoughts. What we try to do, and I don't know how much in Pakistan that is, is we really try to sort of not ignore, but not make the political conversation so dominant in the hashtag. Because the first thing that happens if you introduce and if you try to take a stand as, um, as a movement on a particular very politically charged issue is that you're alienating a lot of people. So what we try to do is always try to get what I call a sober conversation around issues. Even if it's a political issue, let's have the discussion. I just heard, and I, I really can't recall quickly, one of the speakers say, let's talk about the solutions. So it's about a little bit venting. There's a little bit of venting, of course, under the hashtag, but there is also a lot of solutions. We have got the diaspora uh, joining in. In Tanzania, unfortunately, we have not been, unlike, I think, Pakistan, been able to recognize the potential of the diaspora. There's been some attempts, but we're not doing a good job. But the diaspora is really a big part of contributing to the hashtag and to the conversation. And what we discuss can range from everything. It can range from culture. It can range from recently banning some of the hip-hop artists for, for a few months because um, the authority thought that they're very immoral, and the citizens were voicing. Some said, you know, this is us, we are younger, and maybe the authorities should employ younger people because they don't understand what our culture is like. Okay, uh, so as we're talking about the future, uh, I, I saw and we're very fortunate that we have uh, the author who's led the team for putting together Pakistan's Vision 2025, uh, Tanzania also has a vision 2025, and you're trying to break away from donor dependency, better economic management, governance, uh, the non-implementation syndromes. How effectively is the vision 2025 working in Tanzania, and how is hashtag change Tanzania sort of with the social media sort of connecting the two dots? I think that the dots need to be connected. Currently, the Vision 2025 is looked upon by many people, and I'm sure you know, it happens in many parts of the world, that that's something that government does. We are not responsible. So when they hear about good governance or accountability, or they hear about reducing maternal mortality, there's a lot of accusation aimed at the government. But what we're trying to do with that conversation is sort of break it down into the everyday life. So what do we mean by accountability? Uh, what we've done as Change Tanzania, we have had uh, hashtags that accompany our hashtag, but it's around different social issues. Whether, for example, I'll give you an example, the government wanted to introduce a tax on SIM cards. What they said, anybody who owns a SIM card needs to pay at that time a thousand shillings, which was the equivalent of roughly about a dollar, um, every month. We went to talk to the uh, mobile phone operators, and they said 70% of their users do not spend more than 2,000 shillings. So that meant that this would affect very much the low-income uh, Tanzanians. When we tried to argue that, um, just on a conversation, we were told this is a set deal, 
parliament is going to pass it. So we started a hashtag, say no to SIM card tax. And it trended and we did a petition online. At that time, nobody understood really what is a petition. So we had to explain in Swahili what a petition is, how to sign it. We had to go to change.org, which was, everything was in English. So we even had separate little explanations, how to sign a petition and how to sign in and all that. Um, it, was, it was passed by parliament. <clears throat> Once it was passed by parliament, it was taken to the president. So we continued to petition the president. We changed a little bit the petition and we said now no longer to the parliament, but this petition goes to the president. The president signed it and we were still going on. And I remember there was a lot of people who said you've been very rude. Um, and that's why I love the, the theme, disruptive. You've been very disruptive and you'll get arrested. And I was like, why would I get arrested, citizens? So we continued with that. And for the first time in history, the president of the United Republic of Tanzania at that time, Jikaya uh, Kikwete, repealed, he asked the parliament to repeal that particular section in the law that they passed about the SIM card tax. One other thing uh, that obviously Tanzania is known for is the tourism industry. And in Pakistan, we have the most beautiful beaches to deserts to the mountains. And I was fascinated to read uh, while I was reading on Tanzania that uh, Sanam uh, was a girl from Pakistan who cycled up the Kilimanjaro. Uh, how was that taken by the people of Tanzania uh, when she did that? A Pakistani girl where you have this perception about Pakistan, you know, uh, on, on you know, how backwards we are or whatever. And here is this girl from Pakistan. She sort of cycles up the Kilimanjaro. Uh, how did the people of Tanzania take that? Well, first of all, the bad news. The bad news is a lot of, um, some of the media, and especially the citizens, assumed that she was from India. So it took a while until people understood that she's from Pakistan. And the reason being that we have a very huge diaspora um, in, uh, from India in Tanzania. And uh, that is, you know, when they see somebody from this region, they assume that they're from India. But second, um, when they later, you know, got the more, more details about it, one of the things that they were amazed was first they asked, how long has she been cycling? <laughs> that was, like, very impressive. And, of course, uh, the fact that she was a woman was, I think, really the major conversation that started it off. And I think that um, at that time when, when, when I saw, the, you know, the news itself, I thought to myself, we should actually be the ones doing that. And we have somebody coming from far away to, to challenge herself. And, you know, we, I myself have not climbed Kilimanjaro, but most Tanzanians, if they don't live in the region, they don't even think about climbing it. Well, uh, before we close, I'd like you to give a message to the elite corporate sector of Pakistan on what are the potentials or what can we do in Tanzania and how Tanzanians can come to Pakistan to invest in, in cash on this great opportunity of this great uh, infrastructure that we're developing to give access to the world, to China, and uh, I will say this with my humbleness, India uh, and the Central Asian states, Afghanistan. Uh, how do you think or what do you think would be that one message that the Board of Investment and the Pakistani corporate sector can take away uh, with your presence here uh, regarding Tanzania and Africa? I think primarily the fact that Pakistan has become, I would say, very strategic in its development of its economy. And it's looking at more and more getting the, the process, the industrialization going. Africa has been always a very great source of raw material. We've had some of the investors, for example, from China, just going for specifically raw material. But what can happen is if investment happens on the continent, and you know, I, I, I really appreciated the Honorable Minister's uh, point on the concessions and all that. If it happens in partnership, for example, the pharmaceutical industry, the medical uh, equipments, uh, in dire need, people are in dire need uh, and medication and all that is really lacking on our continent. If a country like Tanzania can get into joint production together with a Pakistani uh, firm or factory, the fact that just being based there, they'll be able to target a very, very big market. Think about it. Congo uh, is next door and there's hardly anything. 
they're importing almost everything, but they import everything from France. Why would they import from France if they can get something next door? The other potential area that I see is definitely in cotton. I think that the fact that Tanzania is producing a lot of cotton and uh, because Pakistan has got so much experience in the textile industry, there is a lot of potential there. And finally, I think on many other agricultural products that I said are there. But I think that my final takeaway message is the fact that when we talk always about change, we tend a lot of times to be a bit uncomfortable with change. So um, probably I think a lot of people here are thinking, you know, that sounds pretty good, but I'm, you know, I'm not sure if it's gonna work. I must say it's not gonna be easy. It's, it's similar, but there are some differences in culture, in weather. Um, but I always say you have to embrace change. Change is good. Yes, sometimes we say change is not that good, but it is good. Even when you are disrupted, even when you are uncomfortable, it is good. I would like to very much point out that Africa's growth is not something that is an if, but it's when. And the question is, how much will Pakistan be part of that growth right at the beginning? And this is the best time to be there. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad that I don't have to answer that question. We have the Honorable Minister to do that. Uh, one thing that I must share here, and I, I'm going to do this without even taking permission, is that the CPGNs, uh, the Corporate Pakistan Group, is known for timing. And I think we are slipping on time. So we'll skip the question answer. Maria is here for the next two days. Feel free to talk to her, get more clarity, uh, know more about Tanzania. She's a fascinating woman. I've had a chance to chat with her. And we would like to conclude and thank you for that so that we can sort of bring the time in, in and we'll stop here. Uh, and thank you very much on behalf of all of us in Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very exciting discussion, Mr. Shahid Mahmood and also Mrs. Maria Sarangit say hi. Ladies and gentlemen, just as Maria has said, change is good because with change, we can move forward and be more hopeful. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, please give them a big round of applause.